Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, welcome to this lunchtime seminar on COVID-19 vaccines, uh, ethical issues in allocation, administration, and public acceptance, organized by the NUS Center for Biomedical Ethics and its center's initiative. My name is Dick Chuan. I'm an assistant professor with the center, and I'll be chairing this session. So as COVID-19 vaccines get rolled out across the world, I think we're beginning to see that not just uh, scientific considerations, but also ethical ones that ought to be driving the decisions. So today I'm very pleased to be joined by our panel speakers who have a lot of knowledge, insights, and questions on these issues. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Paul Sambaya, who's an infectious disease specialist and also professor of medicine at NUS. Uh, he'll be giving us a talk on the history of vaccine development and distribution in past outbreaks and epidemics. Next, we have uh, Assistant Professor Lim Polian, who's Director of the High Level Isolation Unit at NCID. She's also a member of the Expert Committee on COVID-19 Vaccination, which makes recommendations to our government on Singapore's COVID-19 vaccination strategy. And she'll be giving us uh, some insights on how vaccine safety and efficacy are weighed uh, in this public health crisis. As well, as well as how uh, groups are prioritized for allocation. Next up, we have Dr. Owen Schaefer, my colleague, who will be speaking on the uh, key basic ethical principles of vaccine allocation using the WHO SAGE framework as a touchstone. And finally, we have uh, Ms. Chua Mui Hong, who is an associate editor at The Straits Times and is formal opinion editor. He's also a member of the NUHS patient and Family Advisory Council. And she'll be talking a lot of very exciting issues on uh, inequities in vaccination rollout, field jumping, which has been happening in some countries, and the potential of creating a privileged vaccination, a vaccinated class of people. So uh, first up, uh, let me ask, uh, invite uh, Prof. Tambaya to give us a history lesson, and I'll be most excited to hear what he's going to say because it takes us back to a time when policemen actually wore shorts. Uh, Paul? <laughs> thank, thank you very much, uh, Tech Chuan, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present at this uh, um, webinar. Um, I actually have an interest in, in, in medical history, and I'm glad that I'm allowed to, uh, to delve into it as the old guy here. Um, so some of you may, uh, may have grandparents who still talk about the polio epidemics of the 1940s and 50s. And, and those epidemics were devastating, especially in um, high income countries. Interestingly enough, the president of the United States, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, was affected by polio and he was in a wheelchair for a large part of his life. Um, what is not known that well is that there were two competing vaccines. Actually, there were three competing vaccines, but two of them dominated the scene. Uh, the Salk vaccine developed by Jonas Salk, which was funded by the March of Dimes, which was actually a, um, a very strong grassroots funding organization based in the United States. Uh, and this was a, a kill vaccine, so it was kind of safe. And then there was the, the live uh, weakened vaccine developed by Albert Sabin. Now, the interesting thing is that both of these men hated each other and they would slime each other re repeatedly, in fact, in the medical literature, in the, in the media, um, and so when Sabin wanted to do his studies, he couldn't do them in the United States. He had to do them in the Soviet Union. And interestingly enough, um, he also did some of his studies in Singapore uh, uh, with uh, Professor Montero, uh, whose son, uh, Professor Montero Jr., uh, was a former director of the CDC in uh, Tantok Seng. So anyway, uh, the point is that there were, there were competing uh, claims about the different vaccines. But what is really striking is that both of them, even though they hated each other, they both contributed vaccines, which made a huge difference. And right now, polio is almost eradicated from the face of the earth. There are only two countries which still have uh, wild-type polio circulating, and they are Pakistan and Afghanistan, mainly in the very mountainous regions uh, uh, um, close to the Himalayas. 
what is also striking is that both of them uh, chose to donate the patents for their vaccines to the World Health Organization, so they didn't make any money at all from the vaccines. So that's actually kind of a success story, competing vaccines, um, marked reduction in disease, end of a pandemic. Fast forward uh, 50 years later, uh, you've got the SARS epidemic. Uh, there was a huge amount of money that was put into vaccine development. Interestingly enough, a lot of it was around the spike protein, which uh, uh, is obviously the target for the SARS-CoV-2. The problem was when, uh, when the, a lot of these vaccines were given to, to monkeys, uh, when they challenged the monkeys subsequently with um, uh, SARS virus, uh, a number of them had inflammation in the lungs. And so a lot of work, they had to go back to the drawing board and try to optimize the vaccines. And ultimately, when there was no more SARS in 2005, 2006, 2007, the money dried up. So what happened in 2005? Infectious disease did not go to sleep, but the bird flu reared its ugly head. And some of you again may remember, bird flu appeared all over Asia uh, and in the Middle East. And uh, uh, the country that was pretty badly affected at the time was Indonesia. And Indonesia had been sharing virus, virus freely with the WHO collaborating centers until the Ministry of Health in Indonesia was made aware uh, through the media of an Australian company which was apparently trying to sell vaccine made from Indonesian seed stock. So, so they obviously went ballistic and they complained to the WHO, to, to everybody, and they threatened to stop sharing virus unless they could get access to vaccines. And that was hugely controversial. Uh, but the net result of which was there was a recognition that, you know, you cannot um, take virus from uh, developing countries and then uh, get uh, wealthy countries to make the vaccine and then take over all of the, the vaccine and, and leave the crumbs to the, to the developing world. And then, of course, uh, we had uh, endemic diseases such as dengue and the dengue vaccine story is an interesting one. Um, where the Health Sciences Authority of Singapore was uh, involved in a risk management plan that really was a model for how you could roll out a new vaccine by monitoring the side effects, the complications, and the, the benefits of the vaccine. So finally, we've come around to COVID-19, and uh, I think the rest of the speakers are going to talk about it. What is interesting to me as well from a point of view of ethics and social justice is, is the current battle that's going on in the WTO uh, with a TRIPS waiver, where the governments of India and South Africa are actually campaigning to the WTO uh, to release the patents for all uh, vaccines, therapeutics, and preventive measures for COVID-19. And this, unfortunately, is being challenged by high-income countries who, who would rather uh, these countries benefit through charities such as COVAX rather than through uh, open access through compulsory licensing. So, so there's a huge number of ethical issues which have come up through the years uh, with the development of novel vaccines for epidemic and endemic diseases. And I look forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Paul. So uh, audience, I uh, should mention that we want this uh, webinar to be not just a conversation between the five of us, but between all the participants. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, in the Q&A, and uh, we try to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, so um, can I invite uh, uh, Pauline to give your talk? Thanks very much, uh, Tik Chuan, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, with uh, all of you. As we think about some of the ethical issues in um, how vaccines are approved and used and uh, allocated, so I'm on the uh, expert committee here in Singapore for COVID-19 vaccination. And uh, one of the first things when we started in October was um, to realize that uh, as we look at evaluating vaccines for Singapore, um, that some of the things that we look at will be specific for Singapore because of our uh, epidemiology and transmission. But we obviously live in a globalized world and we have to take reference from what's happening around the world as well, as well as ethical frameworks. So the first and most important thing when we look at vaccines is to evaluate the vaccine's safety and efficacy. And in many ways, uh, ethics as a clinician is quite straightforward. You have to look at the clinical risk benefit for the patient in front of you. Does it help the patient in front of you? So for example, if it's a cancer chemotherapy, you know, what's the data for the benefit for this person that's sitting in front of you? 
But when you start to look at it at the population level, then you have to look at different um, groups and segments of the population. So it might be good for the population as a whole, but perhaps um, there might be different considerations for different groups. So for example, the older adults, for pregnant women, for children, for people who are immunocompromised, and even for people who are immunocompromised, there may be a wide range, everything from cancer to HIV to uh, transplants, et cetera. So, but the, the challenge when thinking about vaccine safety and effectiveness is not just thinking about the vaccine itself uh, in isolation, because the reason we have a vaccine is because there is actually a, a virus, a respiratory virus pandemic going on. So you're always gonna be weighing this against the reality of the pandemic and how the pandemic affects different people. So, um, and there is also a public health urgency. And that public health urgency is not just a matter of, you know, one person getting sick with COVID and ending up on the ventilator. But if you have 500 people getting sick and taking over all the ventilators in Singapore, what would happen to the other people who need uh, an ICU bed or a ventilator, uh, but for other things, non-COVID things, because they had a heart attack or because they had a surgical complication? So when you look at the effect and the ethics of the vaccine, you kind of have to take the bigger picture, not just COVID, but overall effects on the health system. So as, as people on the EC19V, uh, immunologists, ID physicians, uh, public health experts, um, different scientists of different types, we will be looking at that from different angles, um, basically to make sure that the vaccine evaluation framework um, is able to look at that data. What makes it difficult, of course, is the fact that it's um, a bit of a, a moving target. So the information that's available for us in October and November is quite different from what's available on January or March or moving forward in May. And as you know, the variants and the different efficacy of different vaccines uh, weigh into that. So it's really quite a, a very challenging problem. Um, the second thing is to look at the different roles of um, HSA, which is kind of analogous to the US FDA as a regulator versus the role of EC19V, the expert committee, which is probably analogous to ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Um, and then MOH is kind of the uh, counterpart of US CDC. So it's actually a public health agency. And then the PSAR, which is the Pandemic Special Access Route which is the analogy would be the emergency use authorization. So when you set up the frameworks, the P P PSAR, the Pandemic Special Access Route, allows the use of an unregistered uh, vaccine or medical product for compelling public health reasons. Um, so it's very different from what we're used to as clinicians, where there's a registered medical product, um, and let's just say it's registered for persons aged 9 to 26, say HPV vaccine. If you choose to use it off-label, say for a 29-year-old person, all you need to do is make sure that the clinical risk-benefit for that patient in front of you is, um, is justifiable. But when you're on emergency use authorization, it's really at the direction of the Ministry of Health. And so some of those very individual uh, informed consent kind of dis uh, discussions um, are actually a little bit, there's less latitude for that compared to the, the fact that it's an unregistered product that is basically being authorized uh, for use because of this public health emergency that pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic is. So then when we look at the prioritization of target groups, there is a role for triage when there's uh, scarce uh, resources. And in the case of the vaccines, even though there is a, um, the, the, the vaccine itself um, is in short supply worldwide, um, you know, and many countries will get less than 20% of what they, to cover 20 population or less. Um, Singapore is in the fortunate position uh, of being able to assure everyone living in Singapore of having uh, enough for everyone here. Um, even so, the vaccines will come in a, on a rolling basis. So we have to then decide who's going to get it, and some of that we have to take reference from international uh, guidelines, but we also have to make sure that it's uh, appropriate for Singapore. And the reality in Singapore is that there's near zero local transmission, but things can change really fast. So it again was a very challenging thing. And we decided to prioritize healthcare workers 
because we needed to prioritize not just the fact that there might be an increased risk, but also to preserve the capacity to respond to the outbreak. Um, it's similar to HIV where, you know, HIV is so devastating because it actually knocks out the helper cells, the CD4 cells. So we needed, in a sense, to preserve the response capacity in Singapore to respond to the COVID pandemic. But then after that, it's older patients and um, persons with medical conditions whom we know from the various studies are at increased risk. So that part was fairly straightforward, but it actually is something that we have to defend because we have people who are travelers, uh, who are healthy, wanting to get it, and people, you know, anxious parents, for example, with kids who are studying overseas, vaccines for their kids. Um, so we have to actually stick to the prioritization. Um, the risk communications for safety uh, is another thing that requires a lot of ethical uh, discussion because there is an inevitability of adverse events happening after vaccination when you're doing a population-wide uh, vaccination. So every day, day in, day out, there are people brought in dead to emergency room, people die of heart attacks and strokes, um, people who get anaphylaxis. But when it happens after the vaccination with a novel vaccine, we need to be able to report it honestly, but we need to report it with an understanding that these things happen and we need to be able to look at whether it's caused by the vaccine, not just whether it happens following a vaccine. Um, because there will be a chilling effect on the national vaccine rollout if there's just panic from poorly reported data. Um, so, you know, the, that balance between sort of knowledge and how to present knowledge in a way that is robust and scientifically accurate is also important. On the vaccine ops side, um, when we start rolling it out, and this is really an unprecedented vaccination campaign, right, to vaccinate all 5.7 million people in Singapore in one year, um, there is always the possibility of mistakes, right, when you're doing a lot of vaccinations. So safety is something that's important, but then honesty and transparency about mistakes uh, that inevitably can happen is also part of the integrity and the ethics of a vaccine ca uh, campaign making sure that people who suffer um, the rare side effects are also taken care of, uh, which is part of that vaccine injury financial assistance program. So we need to have, conf the, the vaccinators have to have confidence that they are doing it correctly. Um, there also needs to be public confidence that we're doing it well and safely. Um, and then the logistics and operations need to make sure that there are as few barriers as possible for different segments of the population. Um, the last word I'd like to say is about the uh, COVAX facility. I'm on the, a member on the uh, Independent Allocation of Vaccines group, and I know Owen's going to be covering this in some more detail later, so I won't really go into that in great detail. But I really think it's incredible how, um, between WHO, Gavi, and CEPI, um, there has been you know, a shipment of vaccines to places like Ghana and Nigeria, a number of the AMC countries, which um, are receiving vaccines on the basis of donors. Um, and that really is very encouraging in terms of the ethics of vaccine allocation globally, um, because none of us will be safe until everyone is safe. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. So we have an uh, interesting question from uh, one of the participants who asked what is the ethical difference between open access to vaccine and parity driven vaccine? So I interpret this question as um, the difference between justice-based driven uh, way to sort of distribute vaccines versus uh, charity-based ways. So uh, Pauline mentioned about uh, donor funding and Paul mentioned about social justice. I was wondering whether you could sort of give your reflections on this question. Uh, Paul first. Yeah, so uh, again, as you know, I'm, I'm leaning more towards the social justice kind of approach. and. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the model of the polio uh, vaccine and the fact that both SOC and Sabin vaccines um, had uh, the patents donated to uh, WHO, uh, there's some controversy as to whether uh, SOC could have patented his vaccine. Uh, but uh, that was because the, the, the work actually pre, uh, prefigured some changes in US legislation. But whatever it is, the spirit of what they were trying to do was to ensure that access to the vaccine uh, was not conditional on on paying royalties to a certain company or, or whatever. Uh, and, um, you know, with HIV, for example, uh, the use of compulsory licensing 
which allows uh, low and middle income countries to declare a, a public health emergency, which is a lot easier when the WHO has already declared a public health emergency. And this allows them to get access to drugs and vaccines that uh, are, are manufactured outside of the uh, high income country uh, patent regulations. So in a way, uh, everyone wins because the, the pharma industry can still sell to high income countries because you're not allowed to, you know, to sell um, uh, drugs manufactured by compulsory licensing in high income countries, but you're not denying access to the high income countries. And, and frankly, this helps build capacity. I think this helps build capacity in the low and middle income countries without having them dependent on a, a, a charity or a donor kind of program. Uh, but that's my perspective over. Uh, Pauline? On my side, I would say that, um, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are basically profit driven, right? But they have also stepped up to the plate in a way that um, has really been incredible, if you think about it, because, um, you know, for companies where their vaccine pro uh, programs, development programs failed, they're actually opening their facilities to uh, producing vaccines for their competitor. I mean, it'd be a bit like, you know, McDonald's allowing their facilities to be used to produce KFC or Burger King <laughs> burgers just because, you know, them, their, their burgers didn't sell, right, or didn't work. <laughs> um, so I think in a way to take that away from uh, pharmaceutical companies by forcing the um, reduction of patents uh, is a little bit of uh, potentially an overstepping and taking away some of the uh, incentives perhaps uh, whereas allowing people to give voluntarily is very different from confiscating their intellectual property rights. So I tend to sort of fall on that side of things. Now, I don't think we should call it charity driven. I think that uh, countries understand that as long as any country in the world has uh, replication of virus, it puts everyone at risk. And so in a sense, it makes sense to go ahead and give um, uh, amounts of monies uh, to purchase vaccines at whatever prevailing sort of uh, rates there are. Um, and, you know, certainly volume discounts and so on <laughs> happen. And then on the IAVG and on the uh, COVAX facility, um, the, the decisions about distributing vaccine is driven by both equity as well as equality. Now, equity and equality are two different things, right? Because equality means I give everybody $2. If I've got five children and $10, everyone gets $2. But if someone, for example, needs more money because they're hungry or you know, whatever, uh, they, they have a particular need that day, then giving according to the needs is more equity driven rather than equality. And again, there are ways of sort of um, um, switching that around and adjusting that, um, but uh, that is uh, possible when you have that kind of situation rather than across the board sort of um, abolishing of patents. So, um, so I think that, you know, it's, it's a very fertile ground for discussion. Um, and uh, certainly things like uh, HIV have, uh, medications have given us um, some precedents, but uh, I think, uh, you know, it's something that we need to think about carefully. Over. Yeah, thanks, Pauline. So I think it's difficult for young children, at least in my experience, to distinguish fairness in terms of equality and equity. <laughs> they always want one equal share, I suppose. Um, we have a lot of uh, questions, but I think uh, the next two panelists might be answering a few of these questions. So I'll save these questions towards the end, where we have half an hour for just an open discussion between everyone. I do have a question for Paul, uh, because he spoke about polio. And uh, one of the question is, compared to vaccination efforts for polio, how do you think we are doing ethically this time for COVID-19 vaccination? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a different era. Um, the other thing is that polio primarily affected children. Uh, and as you've seen, uh, people in Singapore are far more willing to uh, spend money or to uh, put in effort for the health care of their children than their parents. Uh, it, it's a sad reality of, uh, of life. So, um, you know, there was a slide we were going to show, which was uh, people streaming into Kalang Airport to get their children vaccinated. Uh, and you had to kind of beat people away because um, they, they were fully aware of the, of the risks of polio. They had seen, you know, we had a whole hospital, St. Andrew's Mission Hospital, which was built for children with uh, uh, complications of polio. Um, and, and so it was very, very obvious uh, what was going on. 
Um, but now we live in a different era. There's uh, a lot more skepticism. Uh, there's also uh, the disease primarily affects older people. And, and so, so there are issues. Um, I just want to make one rejoinder to Polian earlier, which is that most of the basic research uh, for vaccines is actually funded by tech, taxpayers. And uh, so essentially that is given to pharma companies and then pharma companies think that they get it stolen from them with compulsory licensing. And that's why, you know, with compulsory licensing being confined to low and middle income countries, they still can make as much profit as they want um, in high income countries, which is why the TRIPS waiver would be interesting. Uh, but uh, I'm not gonna say anymore. Thanks, Paul. Uh, okay, so uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Owen Schaefer. Uh, to give his talk on the WHO SAGE framework and basic key ethical principles for vaccine distribution. Thanks, TC. Um, so I'll be following up on a bit of some of the things that Prof Lim was uh, talking about. I'll focus on uh, domestic allocation ethics, but there's already been some talk about international allocation and COVAX. So happy in the Q&A to talk about how a lot of these principles do actually apply both domestically and internationally. Um, but I'll, I'll frame this around the WHO's, uh, the World Health Organization's um, Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, sorry, that's the SAGE Working Group. Um, they provided advice on a variety of different aspects of, of COVID-19 um, vaccine uh, provision, and they including a ethics document. And this ethics document they produced uh, has a set of ethical principles that are meant to guide um, nations, uh, countries, uh, and indeed also guide COVAX in making allocation decisions. And it's helpful because it, it is a widely used framework and actually does um, underpin uh, many uh, uh, national policies, including it's reflected in some ways in Singapore's policies. And so frankly, this way helps understand why, as Prof. was saying, why are some people getting it, not others? It's not just arbitrary or amount of political capture. There is um, an ethical basis for it. And, and the first, and in some ways, the most foremost and dominant principle that the uh, SAGE framework puts forward is human well-being. Right? I mean, the point of the vaccine is, to, uh, is not only to save lives, to prevent disease, um, but to ensure that a, a healthcare system is continuing to function. And there's different aspects of human, human well-being that get traded off. But ultimately, this value, um, it's one of several values espoused, but it is kind of first among equals, and it is a, a dominant value. It has um, certain complications, though, because there's different ways in which uh, human well-being uh, can be uh, maximized or improved by a vaccine. Right, so, and, and this is reflected in two different priority groups. So one is to uh, provide a vaccine to those who are mo most at risk of receiving uh, a, uh, or sorry, uh, most at risk of being infected with COVID-19, right? And another is prioritizing those who, if they are infected, will be most harmed by the virus. And so that's when you say healthcare workers are maybe at very high risk of being infected, but elderly individuals are at much higher risk of, um, of suffering and dying if they are infected, right? And so within human, human being, there's a recognition of a trade-off between these two. You know, there's only so many, so many vaccines, at least initially. Um, and so uh, which group gets prioritized? Now for healthcare workers, there's an additional component uh, that Prof, uh, Prof Lim brought up that the WHO also recognizes, right? And that's the idea that in addition to healthcare workers um, in many contexts being at greater risk of contracting the virus, um, if healthcare workers, so to speak, a large number get infected all at once, that can have very severe impact on the healthcare system's ability to deliver care. And that's important because even within the COVID-19 context, that will undermine the ability of any given country to adequately respond to the crisis. Um, it was in the early days of the crisis of the pandemic um, in countries like Italy, there was a massive um, over, overflow and um, a crisis of hospitals un being unable to have the capacity to care for patients. And that led to substantially increased mortality. And the worry is that if you had a larger number of healthcare workers who were infected, um, who were hospitalized and, and falling sick and couldn't care for, for patients, that would severely um, affect the overall societal well-being. So it's not really necessarily uh, just for their well-being, but for social well-being that healthcare workers are often prioritized. And those combination of those two factors um, has often led healthcare workers to be uh, prioritized in most frameworks um, for, before everyone else. That's not just in Singapore, that's uh, generally. Uh, and COVAX indeed has recommended um, in its initial tranche that healthcare workers and uh, broadly speaking, be prioritized uh, for those combination of reasons. So you have the uh, healthcare workers and, and uh, similar, uh, uh, similar um, uh, groups, which are uh, given, uh, generally given first priority, and then sort of the elderly um, and others who have comorbidities that uh, make them especially vulnerable to harm. But human well-being, it should be clear, is not the only value at play in uh, vaccine allocation. 
uh, if it were, we would be something, some, sometimes we call this utilitarian, it's to be over, overly utilitarian to only focus on human well-being. And there's a number of other values that we need to keep in mind in allocation. So one of them is equal respect, equal respect for humanity. Um, and WHO, uh, the SAGE group defines this as treating um, uh, the interests of all individuals and groups with equal consideration and allocation. Um, and essentially it's, it's a matter of, uh, it's, it can always also be described in terms of equity, right? Treating like cases alike, um, and not uh, in, uh, invidiously discriminating against certain groups in society, excluding certain groups uh, for uh, reasons that don't have a good ethical basis. Uh, and and it, it is something that will require a certain degree of sticking to you know, very clear criteria. So we're talking about you have a set of allocative criteria and not trying to sort of um, bend to pressure from certain interest groups. Uh, it was mentioned maybe you know, certain frequent travelers or business leaders might try to get access to that. But if you try to bend to those considerations, which are um, based on soft pressure or other factors, you'll be doing a disservice to the overall community uh, and the ethical principles that are uh, aimed to be upheld. Equity also has import in terms of, um, of justifying why you might not have every subpopulation getting uh, the same access. And it can be a difficult conversation to see some subgroups who might be at risk not receiving vaccine immediately and being able to justify to them why um, why they're not receiving uh, that vaccine is important, at least not receiving that vaccine in the near term, at least in the first tranche, say. Um, and so another that value um, that's discussed often in this context is transparency, right? So being transparent about the reasons why certain groups are prioritized, why certain groups will receive vaccines later versus earlier, um, as well as other matters, of course, uh, relating to the, um, the reasons why uh, we're talking about safety and efficacy, so the, um, the evidence base for safety and efficacy of vaccines and so forth. And that transparency has been seen as generally very important for maintaining public trust and trustworthiness uh, in, in vaccine rollout. Um, a final value I'll talk about that's a little bit more controversial. Um, and while the WHO SAGE group did endorse it, and you can see it reflected in certain regimes, um, not everyone has, has employed it, and that's reciprocity. Uh, sometimes it's thought that certain groups have uh, contributed, especially sacrificed more greatly um, to the uh, uh, combating the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. And there's a thought that maybe those groups are owed um, extra special access or priority um, to the vaccine in light of that sacrifice. And sometimes healthcare workers are argued they deserve extra priority um, because of this. Other groups sometimes are discussed. Um, there are uh, some individuals who were part of clinical trials um, and some of them were given placebo. Uh, they didn't receive actually the vaccine. They received um, a, 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 a needle that was uh, contained just saline. Um, and they would be, um, some argue, uh, needing uh, to be protected um, with the actual vaccine out of recognition of their willingness to risk themselves, risk their bodies as part of the experimental process. But um, not a lot of countries have used reciprocity for a variety of reasons. It's susceptible more than many of the other values to biases, you know, who we think we owe special obligations towards. We might you know, think of prominent individuals, prominent groups, and marginalized groups might fall by the wayside. It's difficult to quantify who, uh, who is more, has sacrificed more, who or more we owe to, whereas things like need and risk of exposure are much more easy to quantify. Um, it's more difficult to be transparent concerning reciprocity uh, stabil uh, and create a stable and coherent um, uh, framework around which groups are owed and which groups are not. Um, and and it's, so it's, it's a big challenge. And so for that reason, for various pragmatic and also political reasons, it hasn't seen as much uh, prominence in allocation. I think I have a few, a few seconds left. Uh, I'll, one last thing that isn't, it's, a, it's a, something that actually is, does not appear in many formal ethical frameworks, but a lot of countries have used it as a criterion for allocation, um, is uh, sort of the, um, how to frame it, uh, the um, setting an example. There's some individuals that if they receive the vaccine, it is thought uh, other people will be encouraged to vaccinate themselves. And this has been used um, uh, sometimes to justify why certain uh, politicians should be given the vaccine first. Um, and there is indeed uh, a thought that, you know, it, they will um, encourage more people to get vaccines uh, and will reduce vaccine hesitancy because they're willing to take on um, the, the, the risks of the vaccine themselves and demonstrate that they, that is indeed um, beneficial. Uh, and actually that, that's had some interesting implications. Um, in Malaysia, there was a minister who used this justification, but it maybe it might seem a counter, counterintuitive way, but I thought, a very inspiring way. Um, he actually declined the initial vaccine that's currently been approved in Malaysia, saying, okay, he's not gonna get vaccinated now. He's gonna get vaccinated with the next vaccine that's approved because there's some suspicion, some people worry, oh, okay, there's a nice first vaccine, the Pfizer or Moderna, that's really great. What about this next vaccine you approve? Maybe it's the AstraZeneca vaccine, maybe it's the Sinovac vaccine, is that second best? 
He's saying, okay, I'll wait until this next vaccine is approved because I want to demonstrate to you, I have full confidence. This is not a second best vaccine. This is a great vaccine. And I'm willing to put my life and my health on the line by going for this, uh, this second vaccine that's approved. And that was, I thought, a really nice instantiation of this value of vaccinating um, in order to uh, yeah, provide some demonstration of confidence. Uh, and that will hopefully, when the vaccine is made more widely available, um, lead to more widespread acceptance and trust in the vaccine. Okay, I'll, I'll end there. I'm just at time. We're going to happy to discuss more of these. A lot of, there's a lot more ethical nuances when it comes to domestic as well as international allocation, why COVAX chose the model that it did, um, and the trade off that was mentioned between equity and equality uh, is, is also really interesting. Okay, over. Excellent. So I think Singapore has taken a model of prioritizing um, higher risk groups um, as the first group to receive the vaccination, right? And slowly we're expanding out to society. Um, we had questions on the ways in which um, different countries have taken different approaches to the allocation. So one question we have asked is, you know, how, uh, given that, you know, some countries decide to, like Indonesia, uh, prioritize more mobile workers, I guess, presumably to sort of restart the economies. Um, how do we sort of uh, distinguish um, this sort of allocation approach from ours? Um, do you have any comments? And I think open it up to Owen first and then uh, the rest of the panelists. Um, I, I won't comment specifically on the Indonesian scenario. I mean, as it was mentioned every country has a different set of priorities and contextual factors that will inform their allocation. Uh, but just thinking more broadly about this idea of opening up, a challenge in terms of vaccinating with an eye towards opening up is this evidence base. Um, and others will be able to speak better to this. There's currently not um, a, a large amount of sort of uh, clinical evidence or, or uh, evidence from rigorous studies that the vaccine can prevent transmission. So the worry is if you vaccinate with the eye towards opening up, um, there's a risk that the vaccine is not as effective at preventing transmission as you would have hoped, and you've mistargeted. And, uh, and if you haven't targeted those that are most vulnerable of dying, you will, uh, you will miss out, so to speak, on the ability to, uh, to save lives in that group. Um, there's counter arguments to that, that people say that some others say that the evidence base right now is good enough that we should be um, vaccinating with the eye towards opening up. I, I, yeah, can, I, can I chip in on that? Yeah. I mean, I think the evidence shows that older people don't respond to vaccine as well. So, so by vaccinating older people in a way you're taking a risk. And in fact, there is data from flu vaccines, which shows that when the Japanese vaccinated the kids, they protected the, the adults. So, oh, uh, I would actually so you're right. I mean, every country has got its own approach. <laughs> Okay. Well, I would beg to disagree with that. Um, you know, the, the lack of efficacy with, with flu vaccine in older people uh, is fairly well known, but the data is not, that's not supported by the data for COVID-19 vaccine, where with the mRNA vaccines, efficacy, vaccine efficacy for older adults is about as good as for younger people. Surprising, but uh, very encouraging. So in that sense, uh, what applies for flu does not necessarily apply directly to uh, the COVID scenes over. Um, the second question we have, uh, again, just for all the panelists, is that given that we have different vaccines with different efficacies, how do we ethically decide who gets the vaccine? Well, I think one of the first things I would say is um, it's very important to be uh, science-based. I think one of the challenges is that um, if you, you may think something, but the whole point of science is that you actually have to prove it with rigorous testing, right? So, I mean, one of the problems, for example, with Trump, uh, you know, affirming uh, hydroxychloroquine was that he was ahead of the science. And then based upon one or two sort of promising studies, which was not borne out by rigorous, you know, placebo controlled trials. So I think when we go, get ahead of the science, um, then we are basically treating a lot of people based upon expert opinion. And experts can be wrong. Uh, it's still a hypothesis until it's actually proven by clinical trials. So the challenge then is that um, with different vaccine efficacies, you know, you can't say I want to give it to pregnant women, kids under if there is currently no scientific data. So there, there would be very clear sort of um, reasons not to do it unless there was compelling urgency. Um, on the other hand, in terms of the different vaccine efficacies, I think in general, we want to give everyone the best that's available, but we can't let the best be the enemy of the good. So for someone to say, you know, because this is a 75% effective vaccine, it's not as good as a 95% effective vaccine. 
you're missing the point, which is that if you don't give the vaccine, it's 0% effective. So would you rather have 75% protection, you know, reduce say 100,000 cases down to 25,000 cases with the effects that it will benefit to have on the health system, or would you rather give nothing? So I think that's really the challenge between sort of the good and the best. Um, and uh, that's part of the ethical issues we have to think about and how to communicate that. Um, the other problem is, of course, it's a moving target in terms of the variants. Um, so countries like South Africa may turn it down because they have a variant where a particular vaccine is less effective. But then you need data and information to support that kind of a decision. Over. Okay. Um, any final comments from on this issue or different advocacies from the panelists? I'm just waiting to hear what Bui Hong has to say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we both jump into uh, Wee Hong's talk on inequities and uh, in vaccination rollout and other issues that are going to come to our world, such as uh, the use of uh, vaccinations as kind of certificate to access places and for international travel. Uh, Wee Hong? Hello, thanks uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak here. I want to thank all the, part all the participants for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, uh, and a little bit of a, a confession. I was getting impatient to join in the conversation. Um, but I must say that um, today I feel like a recreational uh, swimmer swimming in the ocean because you know I'm here with uh, you know um, doctors, infectious disease uh, experts, uh, and and researchers and so on. And um, you know I'm really just a journalist who writes on health issues sometimes and on public policy. Um, issues and I'm also here as a representative of the NUH as Patient and Family Advisory Council. So I thought, you know, um, what I can do is try to offer a, a perspective from a, a public policy angle and maybe a little bit um, as a patient. Um, I've always been interested in ethics, um, as even as a, a student, because I, I think ethics is where, um, you know, the, our idea of the ideal society and what the world should be um, comes face up with the realities of what the world really is. And this is my, my interest in, you know, this whole uh, issue about um, the ethics of uh, COVID um, vaccination and, and so on. Um, when, so so, so I'm, I'm going to just take a, I'm going to, I'm going to just do a quick survey of um, the international scene when it comes to um, vaccine distribution. And then from there, draw out some principles of what is actually happening and uh, try to, uh, morph into a discussion on what an ethical national vaccine distribution policy might uh, look like. Pardon me if um, it sounds not very sophisticated. Um, Paul was kind enough to describe my contribution as being, you know, um, something from the wisdom of the crowds. I think that it's just uh, commonsensical. Okay, uh, when, we, when we read out the news reports about the, the rollout of the vaccine, I think certain, um, for, for me, certain principles uh, have already become very clear. One is that there is uh, what I call weak multilateralism. Uh, there is an attempt via COVAX to you know, ensure equity of access across nations. I think that's very laudable. Um, but as we can see, it is uh, quite, uh, I, I, think this, I think it's quite fair to say it's a fairly marginal effort. And even among, you know, I mean, in, even with the, the EU, you know, one of our, the most successful multilateral organizations, you can see, um, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you can see some of the countries basically wanting to go their own way and bowing out of the the EU program of getting access. I think we, we all know, I mean, we for example, UK is much uh, ahead. Uh, we just saw in the news recently that Italy was going to, planning to ban exports of its vaccine to Australia. I mean, that goes against all the international trade uh, trading rules. What we also see is um, how the distribution and the access to the vaccine actually maps onto the geostrategic realities. So we have Russia, we have Sputnik, we have China, we have Sinovac, you know, we have the US, Europe, um, uh, options. Um, I, I, and I would just say that I think the development of the vaccine and the speed at which things were, were done, um, I think it's a real um, tribute to the, the international um, scientific community of which you all are members, that there was uh, quite a lot of collaboration. So the speed I think has been has been phenomenal, but we already see in the development and the distribution, you know, we are going back to um, reality. We see a fair amount of in every nation for itself or what I call hoarding. We also see um, quite a lot, well, not quite a lot, but we see some instances of um, queue jumping, not just among nations, but also among the, 
um, rich individuals within countries, you know, who want to jump ahead to get access um, to the, the vaccine. So we have, I think the Canadian pension minister was caught up for going to the UAE to get vaccinated first. Um, in the straight side, my colleague reported on an Austrian company um, that's offering vaccination vacation packages uh, for EU residents. You know, you can fly to Serbia and then they will guarantee you some access to this. I don't really know how they are going to get hold of it, but they claim to have um, to have access. So what we see at, uh, I mean, at the international level is, is what I, I, I call sort of um, a, a, a token nod to uh, equity issues via COVAX, but really is that's, you know, it's basically it's, a, it's quite a Darwinian principle. Every man or country for himself and queue jump in. So when we apply it to the national level, what does it mean, right? Uh, I must say, uh, I mean, up front that I'm very proud to be Singaporean when it comes to you know, COVID and, and that includes the way we are going about getting access to it and rolling it out. Because I think we are adopting a fairly principled stand. On the one hand, we um, our, our, our policy is based on trying to adhere to um, you know, the, the best international norms there are. So we will try very hard not to do things like hoard you know, access to ourselves using whatever leverage we can. I think during um, the issue of um, mask and uh, the manufacturing of PPE, our MTI minister, Chan Chun Singh, um, I mean, I think he said it explicitly, right? That we did not know what other countries did. We did not hot supplies for PPE for ourselves, even though some of them were manufactured here. So I think that kind of principle stand um, continues. We are also an active member of uh, COVAX. So in other words, we play um, by the rules. I think also our whole approach of making it not compulsory and yet offering it free is uh, very ethical. It can't be compulsory because, you know, there are individual uh, health risks and Pauline talked about, you know, uh, talked about that um, and yet free to make sure that everybody has uh, access to it and uh, in terms of how we are allocating it uh, I think over went into that um, you know the allocation is based on um, need or risk and that there is some instrumentality in the, the ethics of uh, distribution uh, whether it's based on reciprocity instrumental meaning you know I'm going to give it to those who then can then play a role um, in helping to prevent it for, for others I'm going to give it to people who are useful to, to society I was very glad that Owen mentioned the issue about politicians because if there's one thing that I wish uh, we, we could have done better, I, I wish our government was a bit more upfront uh, on, on this point. I mean, you know, we all saw the, the reports when PM uh, was vaccinated, right? Uh, and, and the way he put it was like, you know, I'm encouraging other um, you know, older Singaporeans to get vaccinated. But of course, at the back of it, I mean, the, the question for my mind, in my mind was like, so is the entire cabinet um, going to get priority for vaccination. I think personally, I think it's a completely defensible um, strategy. Uh, you know, it's the same principle you know, when you're on the airline, you're supposed to put on your oxygen mask before you help others, right? I mean, there, there is merit in making sure that the people who are at the front line, not just in terms of, of facing the, the transmission risk, but at the front line in terms of, you know, planning and, and doing all the strategic work and so on, that they should be protected. But I do wish there had been uh, a bit more upfront um, conversation um, on, on that. Uh, then when it comes to the, I think the, the rollout, the speed of the uh, rollout. Okay, I think it's an interesting point because online I see some criticisms about, you know, oh, why can't Singapore be as quick as Israel uh, or even the UK, right? Um, and I, I, again, I think uh, we are quite pragmatic and quite smart because, you know, this is a, these are all relatively unknown uh, vaccines. We don't quite know the full side effect. I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying I'm making all this observation just as a pure observer, okay? I don't know the, the, the research and so on. And also as an observer of you know, public policy, decision making and so on. So it's, to me, it's completely um, sensible uh, not to want to be among uh, the first. Um, so and, and of course, because um, we have quite low uh, community transmission, so the, the impact of being not so fast is not as great as in the UK, for example, where the virus is already, was already quite uh, widespread. Um, okay, I just want to say a little bit about the, the triaging. I, I think on the ground, there is uh, some concern and some question. I mean, I, I can, I think they are really, they are really reflected in the, the Q&A, you know, things like um, how come we don't get a choice as to what vaccine, you know, uh, to get. And then, I, I mean, among my, my groups of friends and in the WhatsApp chat, there's so many questions about, you know, my parents, you know, they are on blood thinners. Is it okay? I'm on this medication. Is it okay? And, and what I find is that those who have good access to their, their GPs or their doctors are able to get good answers. So a friend said that also the, the doctor's advice was if you're on blood thinner, I think stop it for a few days first or, or whatever. So my appeal to all of you who are, who are watching this, the participants, especially the GPs and the doctors who are on the front line, you know, it's really just um, do give your time. 
uh, you know, and be, be very approachable because I think many Singaporeans out there have a lot, a lot of questions about you know, whether they should be vaccinated, what are the risks, what should they be ahead, and what kind type of vaccine. I mean, there are, there are just so many um, 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 questions. So I, I think that the panelists, you guys have been great so far in giving the overall big picture, but I, I hope there'll be you know, some time um, to drill down into how do we respond to the concerns of patients when it comes to, to you know, very nitty gritty kind of issues. And it may well be that you, know, you, have, you, have, you guys have to work with MOH, and of course it's the media that I'm talking as a journalist, uh, to, to roll out some of these very nitty gritty um, detailed point by point um, uh, answers to the, the genuine questions that uh, people have. Um, then, I mean, I did say something about the privileged class. Um, I think the, the whole vaccination rollout, we, we are going to see the creation of uh, a privileged class of those who are already um, vaccinated. Um, because you have uh, a free movement, you may be able to travel, uh, then you have you may have access to jobs because your employers are more likely to want to hire you or to field you um, and, and so on. But okay, but over here, I must also add that uh, precisely because no one is safe until everybody is safe, the, the, the merits and the benefits of being belonging to the privileged class is actually naturally modulated. So one small example. So I, I, I know someone who's a, who's a air steward. So he was among the very early ones to be vaccinated. And you're saying that he's going to be so he's, he's going to be in demand, you know, by by the airline because they're going to call on him for every flight. But then back home, he has a, a wife and a, a baby son. So even though he's vaccinated, we all know that you know that protects him from severe disease, but not from infection, which means he could still, you know, potentially bring it back to the the family. So I think so long as there are all these moderating um, uh, factors, and given that we all live in communities with families, I think the the fears of uh, an ultra privileged class may be slightly uh, overblown. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Mei Hong. Uh, yeah, so I think even if some individuals are privileged to get a vaccination, potentially their family members might not because they are not uh, uh, eligible now for vaccination because they are pregnant or because they are children and things like that. But that's something I think we ought to think about. I have a question for you, Mei Hong. So you, I think you expressed your agreement that you were glad the, our government did not mandate uh, vaccination. So that's one strategy, right, in which you want to increase vaccine uptake and sufficient vaccination coverage in the population. Uh, in Singapore, only diphtheria and measles are the, are the only vaccines that are mandated by law, right? So that's one strategy. The other strategy is to make um, vaccination a requirement to do many things like uh, go for concerts, watch a football match, go for travel and things like that. So you, you can sort of create a more coercive environment to get people to be vaccinated, even if it's not mandated by law. And that's actually happening in places like Israel. Right? So you need, in order to eat a restaurant, you do need a, what they call a green passport, uh, which is a vaccination, vaccination certificate. I was wondering what about your thoughts on this uh, second approach of making vaccination a condition for entering and participating in many aspects of civil and social life. I'm going to stick my neck out here and you know uh, try to second guess the government. Knowing the second government, they won't go anywhere near making that compulsory. <laughs> They'll just leave it to the private sector and uh, the the venue owners. I mean, if you're going to organize a concert and you want to impose it as a rule, you know, by all means, I don't think they will they will prevent organizers from having that as a rule. But I don't think they will want to legislate or make it a, a, a compulsory rule. I mean, given that you know they are not they are not compelling anybody to get vaccinated, so that's consistent. That would be consistent with their stand. I think it's very practical. Actually, can I chip in here? You know, um, uh, for travelers to Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, you're required to get the meningococcal vaccine for the Hajj and the Umrah, and, and you can't get into Saudi Arabia without that. Uh, similarly with the flu vaccine. Um, and also for travelers to South America or, or many parts of Africa, uh, the yellow fever vaccine is compulsory. And in fact, people who travel from those regions to Singapore uh, Singapore mandates the yellow fever vaccination, so you have to have documentation. So, so there is a precedent for, for at least for travel. Um, and, and you know, with events, uh, uh, I was at an event at MBS where they had to swap the participants every day, you know, and, and, and people went along with that. So, so there is a possibility, and, and I believe that there are schemes which are in place um, for, uh, for travelers from certain countries where, where they do um, allow for, um, what do you call it, uh, for recovered uh, uh, individuals. Uh, and it's gonna be very hard to tell recovered individuals from people who had vaccination with uh, uh, whole virus vaccines. 
So, so I think the, the scientific landscape is complicated and the, the public health landscape is probably even more complicated. So, um, so it's just that there, there's many different permutations and, and combinations over. I'd like to jump in on that point. Um, I think it is possible by serology to tell apart people who are vaccinated, who have vaccine immunity versus virus immunity, because those with uh, vaccine immunity should, not, should be uh, nucleocapsid protein uh, antibody negative versus those who have uh, just a real infection, um, they would be nucleocapsid uh, uh, antibody positive. So there are ways of telling that apart. On the point of sort of mandatory versus sort of, um, you know, making it more uh, vaccination or recovery status as part of a requirement to participate in certain things, in a way, participating in those things is a bit of a privilege. Um, so you have a right to sort of refuse vaccination but you also, you know, there's no, uh, in a sense, right to attend, say, to go out to eat at a restaurant, right? Um, so you could make that argument that it's just part of fairly hard-nosed risk mitigation. I mean, in the same way that, you know, people who are high-risk drivers may pay a higher insurance, and those who are lower risk, you know, would pay a lower insurance premium. But that's, of course, predicated on everyone having equal access to the vaccine. So I think right now, you know, WHO recommending that vaccine passports not be made a requirement of travel. I think that that's part of the ethical discussion, that there isn't equal access at this time. But that's, again, a bit of a moving target, and that will change across time. Um, so I think um, if countries, uh, countries are allowed to protect themselves, but the level of... Um, restrictions will depend, has to be proportionate, which is always a principle with public health measures. So for example, you can travel, but it does mean that you have to have a pre-departure or on arrival testing um, that's negative. And you can come, but you would have to stay in SHN uh, to mitigate the risk of an unvaccinated person bringing infection into a country. Whereas someone who's, who is vaccinated has a lower risk and therefore, you could argue that it's unfair to put them to the same level of restrictions compared to someone else because it's not reality based. They do have a reduced risk. Um, so it's an interesting discussion. Over. Um, yeah, so. I just want to push a little bit, uh, hold in a little bit, you know. So when does the, one question, and that's a question from the audience, you know, when does the carrot, you know, those incentives that you give um, for getting vaccinated actually become a stick? So when does the line between, what do you think the line between, I guess, persuasion, information, financial incentives uh, actually become coercion? Yeah, I think the line becomes coercion when it's something that you should be doing. For example, school. Um, you know, children are supposed to go to school, I think by law, <laughs> unless you have special permission to homeschool them. And so then if, uh, uh, and, and obviously that's a moot question right now because kids under 16 uh, really cannot be vaccinated. But for example, if you did have a situation where kids under 16 were allowed to be vaccinated because there was now data and then um, a parent chose to be say, who's got, you know, strong anti-vaccine sentiments, chose not to vaccinate their kid, and the child were not allowed to go to school as a result, then um, that becomes, I think, a bit of an issue. Um, and that has to be balanced against the public health risk of having a school outbreak. Um, and there is already uh, accumulating data to show that um, vaccination actually does reduce infection, not just disease and not just severe disease. And there's already growing uh, emerging evidence that vaccination reduces transmission um, because in addition to infection. So I think that uh, once there is strong data that it actually reduces transmission, then it starts to shift that discussion a little bit more. So, you know, if you were medically eligible to get the vaccine, but you chose not to get the vaccine, um, do you have a right to put other people at risk over? Owen and uh, Mui Hong, do you want to jump in with some comments? Um, I mean, maybe just to say one thing. Again, I think I'll just reiterate, all of this depends on at least two of the coercive measures depend on these two things. One being 
sufficient evidence that it does prevent the, vex the, the vaccine prevents transmission. Some people think we're at there now. Some people think we need more evidence. That's an empirical question. Um, and the second thing is um, it's contingent upon there not being sufficient willingness, so to speak, um, to get uh, uptake in the population. So if you recall with Trace Together, um, initially Trace Together was you know used as a, a voluntary mechanism, and you didn't get we didn't get quite enough uptake with purely voluntary mechanism, and gradually. Um, a, a soft mandate and access, uh, a mandate for using Trace Together to access certain venues was rolled in as a way of getting, uh, now I think it's up to 80 or 90% uptake of Trace Together con uh, contact tracing apps, right? So it was, it was a react, it was initially you try it out, you see if you can get through just voluntary action, you can get uh, enough uptake to get to maybe herd immunity with, with uh, vaccines. And if you can't get there um, uh, with, with just voluntary action, then you might consider a mandate. That might be a, a, a kind of proportionate way um, and it uh, reflects the value of necessity. You only make a mandate if it, if it is necessary to achieve the public health end. But that's a separate question from, I think, travel where you can't, you know, because have, I think that's separate from vaccine passport for travel where there's, there's a separate set of considerations. Yeah. Just wanted to um, go back to the point about uh, whether, you know, we should give people a choice of the, the vaccine. I mean, I understand that some countries do, but in Singapore, um, we have not. Just wondering, actually wanted to hear from the, the, the panelists on, um, is it possible to give some level of choice, um, especially, I mean, I understand that for medical reasons, some people with anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis are actually um, not keen on the Pfizer and Moderna, they're actually waiting for the Sinovac because it's based on an older protocol or something. So I mean, where, where there are reasons why not give uh, people a choice or that screw up our entire vaccination rollout. Um, I guess I'll, I'll take that question. Um, that's not considered a choice in the sense that, you know, if you are not allowed to get uh, the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna uh, because of anaphylaxis, then we are giving you a positive um, decision that we will let you know when the next vaccine that is safer. And that's assuming that actually has a lower risk of anaphylaxis than the mRNA vaccines. Um, so that data, of course, is still out, uh, uh, you know, still pending. Um, but if it had a lower risk, then obviously we would say, please get that vaccine. So remember, the stance is that we would like to vaccinate everyone, but we need to be able to do that safely. And obviously, on the basis of scientific evidence, right, medical evidence. Um, so if we are not sure that we can uh, vaccinate you safely and say the risk of anaphylaxis is, you know, potentially greater than the risk of catching COVID since we're near zero transmission, then ethically it's not appropriate, right, to ask you to get vaccinated with something that's potentially higher risk than um, the actual, you know, the, the, the risk of the disease. But as I said, that is, a, again, a moving risk that can change very fast. So if you said that, you know, let's let you choose things, then it means that, you know, you actually have to have real choices. So if I have you know, 10,000 people and I can't detect whether they'll want Moderna or Pfizer, then I actually have to stop 20,000 doses, right? 10,000 for Moderna and 10,000 for Pfizer. Um, it's a little bit like when you go to a restaurant, right? And then, you know, that particular entree that you want, chicken or fish, uh, whatever, the chicken's gone, then you'll have to eat fish, right? Um, so it, is it ethical then in a broader context to maintain, you know, to have 20,000 doses of vaccine so that 10,000 people can choose the vaccine that they want. And in a sense, you're withholding that from the rest of the world, right? You could uh, argue that that would be unethical to actually have choice because uh, it's not just um, for Singapore, it's also for the rest of the world. Yeah, uh, can I chip in here? You know, what I usually tell my patients is that uh, when the government gives it to you for free, you have no choice. You just wait while uh, when the, they start uh, commercially making it available, you can go to whichever GP has whichever vaccine, and then you'll, but you just have to pay for it. <laughs> it's just uh, uh, something that Singaporeans kind of understand, I think. Right. I just want to push the point on. So we have talked about uh, mandating the entire population. There's a question about um, compelling healthcare workers uh, and, and you know, kind of infringing on the right not to be vaccinated, um, there can be institutional pressure to prioritize vaccination over the choices. For example, suggesting that women withhold conception or breastfeeding to receive the vaccination. Uh, Paul, uh, Pauline, given that you're medical professionals, what do you think of such, uh, I guess, administrative uh, strategies? 
Okay, we're not recommending that women withhold <laughs> conception of breastfeeding. We're saying that out of an abundance of caution, if uh, you know, if uh, you know, women are advised that they you know should consider sort of uh, suspending it. But if a woman says, you know, I've got a newborn and I really cannot withhold breastfeeding, we would say, please go ahead and get the vaccine. And actually, now that there's more data, because like there are 90,000 people vaccinated, uh, 90 million people vaccinated in the United States. Um, the knowledge landscape has changed tremendously. You know, when we first started writing this, the guidelines in December, there was like no guidance out there <laughs> other than like the UK and the US, right? And there was no population-wide data. And it was a brand new mRNA vaccine. And we were getting questions like, oh, am I gonna be a genetically modified organism by the time I get the vaccine? Okay, um, now that we've got 90 million doses and you know, we're chugging along in Singapore, it's over 600,000, I believe. You know, we've got a lot more data and confidence. So we can say, and there are actually women who've gotten vaccinated who were pregnant or, you know, and certainly in the United States, um, they are vaccinating people. Uh, and the WHO actually has no recommendation to stop breastfeeding uh, or to defer conception. So it was us in Singapore being super kiasu, <laughs> saying, uh, mumble, 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 please, can you consider with just holding off on conception because we're, we're being, you know, just very, very kiasu. I think we're gonna eventually change that quite soon, but we wanted to change it on the basis of data because we are getting pushed from both sides. We're getting pushed from people who are saying, how dare you use this vaccine when, you know, there's like no data about it and what are the long-term side effects? And then on the other hand, we've also got, um, you know, people saying, you know, why are we not rolling out faster? That like, you know, the Israel and, and the UK. Well, Israel, the UK and the US are basically on burning platforms, right? They've got thousands of deaths and thousands of cases, millions of cases. So my analogy is like, you know, most people in their right mind would not jump out of a four story window, right? Uh, unless you're suicidal. But if the building's on fire and you've got a fire engine down there with a trampoline and people catch you, then yes, it is perfectly rational to jump out of a burning building from the four story window. So in a way, it's kind of like that with vaccines. These are new vaccines. We are hesitant about it. We don't necessarily want to be the absolute earliest adopters but we do know that the vaccines protect from the best available data. So it made sense. We were trying to sort of balance both sides. And right now, of course, the building isn't burning, but it can change really fast because, you know, the countries around us and in the region are in situations where, you know, if you talk to colleagues in Malaysia, you know, they were, their health system was were pretty overwhelmed and full over. Maybe I can just chime in here. Uh, yeah, so it is, of course, that need for data is really important um, for uh, indicating indication for uh, pregnant breastfeeding uh, women. Um, and I think this uh, shows why there was an, when the vaccines were tested, pregnant breastfeeding women were excluded from trials. I think we should it should now be clear that was a huge mistake um, because it turns out it was it's in the U.S. and U.K. and and maybe other countries. Um, it's re recommended for those populations anyway. Now they were excluded from trials out of a concern for protecting the trial participants. But the end result is that tens of thousands, hundreds of, maybe hundreds of thousands more women will be exposed to the vaccine without that data. We'll have population level data from in the US because of that, so that's real world data, that's kind of valuable. But if we had had um, you know, a controlled data from a trial of a small number of participants with safety data, we would have had a lot more confidence in those populations. This is a bit of a bugbear of mine, but it just shows we need to be more carefully thinking about inclusion of pregnant women, breastfeeding women, other uh, populations typically excluded in trials of this sort, over. I'm glad you asked raise the, the question of clinical trials. Um, there's a question from the audience, Owen, um, and I'm going to read it as it is. Given the current COVID-19 vaccines are now used on a mass basis, would there still be a need to conduct clinical trials? If so, should the trials be conducted in the traditional way to answer safety and efficacy issues, or should they, in addition, how answer questions that have arisen from mass use? Yeah, I, still... I, have, uh, I have a couple of uh, things to say about this, uh, having done a few uh, vaccine clinical trials before. Um, first of all, um, I think the, there's an even more uh, reason to do clinical trials uh, because you know, none of the vaccines are actually fully licensed anywhere in the world. Uh, they've only been given a provisional license and we still, and we, we really do need to see the long-term data. You know, uh, I mentioned Dengvexia the dengue vaccine. And it was only after one or two years that we realized that there was this problem of antibody dependent enhancement. So 
what, uh, what I think the question is referring to is placebo controlled trials. And it's going to be impossible to do placebo controlled trials when you've got widely available uh, vaccines. Uh, pharma may not like this because the barrier is going to be really high. If you have a Pfizer vaccine, which claims a 95% efficacy, you're going to need thousands and thousands of patients uh, to be anything better than that. So you're, you're going to be stuck in this, uh, this murky world of non-inferiority trials, which are, which are really, really hard to do and design and to interpret. So, so that's the first part of that. The second thing is that, um, you know, the animal data needs to be out there. Uh, and and uh, going back to Owen's point about pregnant and breastfeeding individuals, uh, uh, I know this is not popular, but uh, uh, there needs to be uh, data uh, on uh, pregnant and breastfeeding uh, non-human primates. Uh, and then we can be, be pretty uh, confident. And of course, now with the massive rollout, uh, post-marketing surveillance, pharmacovigilance, uh, that kind of information will be really, really important over. I'll jump in on to say that, you know, um, one of the challenges with running uh, uh, clinical trials during outbreaks, um, and even in general, is, uh, you know, that the clinical equipoise changes, right? So we saw this with, for example, with HIV, you know, uh, when AZT was against placebo, then a data safety monitoring board has to intervene and end the trial uh, early if there is, you know, statistically significant difference to show that AZT uh, reduce mortality because it's unethical to continue then with placebo. So in the case of the cl current clinical trials, you know, uh, the companies like for Pfizer and Moderna want to run the studies for two years to look at long-term uh, safety data, but it's no longer ethical to withhold vaccine once you know that it's 95% effective and reduces se severe disease and mortality to have uh, a placebo arm. So they've actually had to, in a sense, provide vaccine to the placebo arm. And then that collapses the ability to sort of look at long term, you know, in the sense of one or two years worth of safety data. So I think that, um, you know, it is the reality of trying to do medical research that in the process of getting clean data, we cannot harm people. I mean, the Tuskegee trials, you know, and all those kinds of things have clearly shown that, you know, those kinds of ethical considerations are paramount. Um, and it, sometimes it does mean that we'll never know uh, the, the answer, but in a sense, you know, things have changed now and we are moving forward, uh, but we're moving forward on a different platform with a different sort of set of uh, uh, comparisons and comparators, over. Maybe I can just offer an alternative view. So I, I do think that placebo-controlled trials are ethical to continue in this context, uh, and it is different from the Tuskegee trials, particularly because not all populations currently have access to the vaccines. Um, so the key question is going to be, are you made worse off by the trial, right? And if you don't have access to a vaccine anyway, either because your country has a slower rollout or because you're not in a priority group, um, mm -hmm. then I don't think there's any particular problem with continuing a placebo-controlled trial um, uh, during that period. And even once it's available more, more widespread, you can even uh, make an, a request and ask for volunteers who are willing to forego uh, vaccination. You have to be very careful to ensure they're, uh, they're not being uh, pressured, but uh, ask for extraordinary volunteers who are willing to forego a vaccine for at least a little while uh, to get a placebo-controlled trial uh, for, further, um, for further vaccines. Um, but I, I do think that, yeah, because the, the alternative actually is not that um, you're excluding people from getting a, a vaccine. It's, are you giving trial participants priority access? Maybe a, a young 30 year old healthy person, are they getting a vaccine before uh, someone who is you know, maybe older and at um, higher risk, but simply because they were in a trial? And that's the reality of, um, of unblinding and providing the vaccine to the placebo, placebo group. But that's interestingly a decision not made by governments. It's not the government's decided to, um, to unbind and, and require um, uh, placebo groups to get the vaccine. That's the pharmaceutical company decision. Um, that's their determination. It's one of the, the very few aspects of prioritization that was not determined by governments. It was determined, determined by pharmaceutical companies. Over. Thanks, Owen. So let me move the conversation to the space about public acceptance. Like, um, and I guess uh, we're doing some things to address misinformation and to reduce uh, vaccine hesitancy. I'm just wondering whether, uh, for, for Miho, what do you think of the, what, what do you think we have done well so far in terms of addressing misinformation from a policy viewpoint? Um, okay, I think what helps is uh, having a general uh, framework, having an expert committee to advise and so on, and fairly consistent, clear messaging um, on our broad um, strategy. 
on our broad um, overview. Uh, yeah, I think those are, are really um, helpful. Um, where, what I would like to see improve is actually more granularity in terms of you know, how the decision making is arrived at. Um, you know, like how do you stratify the, the risk? So one small example. I mean, supposing you have you know, 100,000 doses of Pfizer. Um, of course, you want to prioritize healthcare workers, but you allocate a certain proportion of that to you know, other populations that may also need it to the elderly, for example. Um, and, and so you know, what proportion is given, um, what is a, a, what's the ethical basis for that kind of decision-making? Uh, and actually just half an hour before this um, webinar, I received one of the, the uh, MOH you know, notification, and it says that vaccination is extended to those in critical functions, and it says postmen, delivery staff, news reporters, and bank operation. <laughs> so this is the first I know that, oh, okay, you know, uh, news reporters, journalists, we may also get access to the, the vaccine sooner rather than later. Um, but, you know, this is what, this is what I mean. We, I, I think uh, apart from healthcare workers and those who I know um, in the pioneer generation and then the 70s and so on, the rest of us really have no clue, right, as to when we might have access to it. So I, I would have, you know, liked a little bit more information from the, the government or the expert committee on, on the, 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 prioritize, on the prioritization. But otherwise, I, I think I think at the, the the big picture level we are doing quite okay. But my concern actually is you know the the proliferation of all the WhatsApp messages and questions that are being uh, quite wide quite widespread actually. So there, I, I think that they they do contribute to um, hesitancy to get vaccinated. I'm not quite sure how to counter it except I mean I'm a media person, so I just say ah oh, MOH spend a lot of money you know advertising on all our media. <laughs> And uh, you know, basically, the, the public communications has to be very, very proactive at this stage now. Yeah. Well, from, from the expert committee, I think, you know, we sort of set aside the broad um, prioritization groups. And then some of it obviously is um, just uh, practical logistics of vaccine rollout, you know, because if you think about it, <clears throat> you know, trying to vaccinate, you know, 10 million doses of vaccine in 365 days um, is works out to be like over, you know, 27,000. But since practically, you know, it doesn't happen uh, 365 days a year. I mean, we're talking probably about 40 to 50,000 doses of vaccine, you know, until we get to 10 million, right? Um, so obviously there will be, um, you know, patchiness because you can't roll out everywhere at the same time especially if you're trying to do it safely, because you know, we have to train vaccinators, we have to get the logistics going and so on. Um, but we did say that 5% of the <clears throat> vaccine stock would be allocated for various critical functions. And I think the various critical functions is actually made above the level of the expert committee <clears throat> at the government level. Um, and it looks at a number of other things. Um, so I really can't speak to that. But um, I think one of the considerations is that when we look at the epidemiology of where the new cases are happening in Singapore, <clears throat> um, you know, that sort of gives you an idea why, for example, we decided to vaccinate, say, the people working at Changi Airport. Because in a way, you know, you've got <clears throat> Singapore fairly clean inside the near zero transmission. But the places, if you look at the number of cases coming in, Singapore is being pinged, you know, with, say, 200 cases a week, right? you know, 21 day, 31 day imported cases. And so in a way, the inputs into the system is basically where the leaky gaskets are. And the leaky gaskets are at the entry points into Singapore, whether it's the SHN hotels. So, you, you know, you could be a cleaner, you could be a hotel staff worker, you could be someone working at Changi Airport at Jewel. Um, so, you know, that it was fairly rational and sort of evidence based to try to address some of those leaky gaskets. Um, and, and make sure that um, that is one sort of rational way to deal with it. Then the second way rationally to think about it is the people who have a lot of different interactions with a lot of different people. Um, the, other, the third way to think about it, like with the teachers is to, in a sense, cocoon the most vulnerable. So for example, if you've got kids who can't be vaccinated under the age of 16 or 18, then what you can do is sort of protect those who interact with them, for example, the teachers. So that's my understanding of how some of these priority groups are being um, allocated. And uh, sometimes, you know, transparency is um, 
that, that you know, there, there's only so much transparency you can achieve. <laughs> for example, mothers don't wear transparencies <laughs> uh, for other obvious reasons. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the point's well taken. And uh, overall, it's been a fairly sort of systematic and logical and orderly rollout. Um, and it's probably more rational than many uh, other places over. I'm quite fascinated that news reporters are on the on the risk list of high risk groups, because you know every every study in the world has shown that uh, grab drivers and uh, cab drivers actually have uh, uh, have the highest incidence of uh, occupationally acquired COVID, uh, way above uh, healthcare workers in most countries. But um, but you know unfortunately these guys uh, tend to it's difficult to uh, to reach out to this community. Oh, but um, hang on. The, the bus drivers were among the, the yeah. very yeah. first ones to be the Grab drivers. The, the drivers. Bus drivers yeah, actually are drivers of, In Singapore, there's only like one bus driver. Now. And I think in Japan and Korea, there have been a handful. Yeah, Grab drivers are receiving vaccines now. All the Grab and Gojek drivers got texts. So you get the yeah, vaccine. the Grab drivers got it before the reporters. Okay, right. good. Bus drivers were among the first, and then we went, rode out to taxi drivers and private hire. And then the journalists come next. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I think there's an interesting question of, you know, if you belong to a privileged group, I mean, a group that's going to be receiving a vaccine, but you don't really agree with the prioritization, should you take the vaccine? I guess it's a matter of personal morality. Um, we have, running, we're running out of time, and I'll leave you guys with this uh, very important question raised by a participant. It's a good way to round up this whole discussion, and here is the question. Looking ahead, and with the assumption that the world will likely face another pandemic, what do you think are some lessons or issues that we should consider and discuss now? This may help us shorten our response time the next time. So I'm going to give uh, one minute, I guess, to each of our panelists to give their thoughts on this, uh, starting with Owen. Uh, okay, then I get the short straw to answer first, uh, collect my thoughts. Um, yeah, so uh, just in terms of lessons for next time, I think, okay, I'll, I'll take the international lens here because that's the easier lens. Um, definitely there needs to be a global anticipation because there will be another um, uh, event of this magnitude at some point, uh, maybe in our lifetimes. And, and, and taking that attitude, needing to have a, a system of global cooperation. COVAX is very, uh, very much of a reaction to uh, what happened. It was put together very quickly, but having a systemic international treaty um, that uh, sets out how we're going to respond to these sorts of pandemics uh, in the future, share data, um, share, uh, share vaccines, uh, share innovation, share capacity. And as Paul was saying, um, in the near term, start building up manufacturing capacity around the world in LMICs. That's, that requires investment now. Um, that's going to be sort of expensive up front because you need to set aside money for that sort of thing. You need to set aside uh, resources. The hope is that when you do it now uh, or, uh, and you don't know who's going to be worst affected, the idea of we're all in it together can help out. Everyone will sign in not knowing who's going to be worst affected. This time, U.S. turned out to be very worst affected. Maybe next time, Singapore will be extremely badly affected. Hopefully, um, that kind of uh, approach can lead to more cooperation um, and lead to uh, more rapid and, and equitable out, uh, rollout of uh, vaccines and other interventions for the next time. Thanks, Owen. Sorry for you on the spot with being the first respondent. I'm just going to open up to either Paul, Paulian, and Mi Hong. Who yeah, wants to go I'm going to I'm going to jump in next. Um, I think I'm on record uh, at several presentations for um, for predicting that uh, it'll be October 2022 uh, when we get an influenza pandemic, and uh, this is going to be a lot worse. Um, part of the reason why I'm saying that is because uh, influenza has disappeared worldwide. Um, the other viruses are, are still around and they're coming back to pre-pandemic levels, but uh, the WHO has essentially, uh, in the influenza reporting, they can't find influenza. They find it in a handful of places. Um, and when we do get an influenza pandemic, it's unfortunately not going to affect uh, old people only. It's also going to affect young people. And, and so unfortunately, I think that uh, we're going to learn all the wrong lessons of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, all travel is going to shut down. Uh, it will take a while before um, you know, vaccine uh, capacity comes up. The one good thing that's happened is I think uh, testing capacity is, uh, has been tremendously uh, increased. So, um, and also the infrastructure for clinical trials has also improved. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, I, I've been telling all my friends, 
you know, the reason why I got vaccinated in a hurry is so that I, I can travel <laughs> because there's going to be a really short window when, you know, once the travel restrictions are lifted for COVID before they get uh, reimposed for the, for the coming uh, influenza pandemic over. I guess we'll go next. Um, so, you know, looking forward at the next uh, pandemic or uh, outbreak, I think, you know, uh, I, I sort of always remember Hickam's dictum, um, which is that the disease is going to do whatever hell, the hell it wants to do. And so one of the challenges with uh, pandemics is not to take the wrong lesson. You can't drive forward looking in the rear view mirror all the time. So you have to actually take every pandemic or uh, outbreak on its own merits and not take the wrong lessons from the previous one. But I would say that, um, you know, social media and sort of all of the IT stuff is here with us to stay. And so infodemiology is actually one of the most important battles we fight as we've seen with this pandemic. And I think part of the ethics of any outbreak is that there is fear um, and there is inequality. But to fight that, we have basically got knowledge and honesty and what we have to do is it's unethical to withhold knowledge. We actually have to get out there ahead of the misinformation and just be really, really proactive about, um, you know, speaking the truth, speaking it with grace, you know, speaking truth to power. And that applies whether it's for testing or vaccines or quarantine and isolation. It needs to be a rational approach, but we have to be able to articulate it well. Over. Mm -hmm. Um, just a quick response. I agree totally with, with Pauline. Um, and, and now I, I speak as a, a public policy observer. And I, I think uh, it's, it's vital that we draw the right lessons uh, from COVID. And to me, the, the main lesson is the importance of trust you know, between health authorities and citizens and the, the state and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's, to me, it's very important that the, the way we handle um, COVID, I think we are doing quite well, um, but in general, um, no, we have to be quite open about admitting our mistakes and so on. And just importantly, just preserve the, the bond of trust. Now I speak as an individual and a, a patient. So like, like, like Paul, I, I agree with him totally. Um, the, the lesson for me from COVID-19 before the next pandemic strikes right, is uh, travel when you get the chance <laughs> because the window is not going to be open for long. And then importantly, um, given that it's going to be uh, for the long haul, um, learn to enjoy life uh, in Singapore. We have great park connectors, you know, and then uh, we should enjoy um, what remains of our forests. You guys are all talking about using your privilege. <laughs> <laughs> privilege class, over. I think I've visited almost all parts of Singapore <laughs> by now. Okay, uh, it comes to the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, I hope all of you have enjoyed uh, the session. Um, just like I express my thanks to all the participants, uh, especially those who raised the questions who re which really drove the conversation. Let us thank, of course, our panelists for their talk and their great insights. And lastly, to Centers, which is an initiative of uh, CBME uh, to provide, provide ethics support to ethics committees in Singapore. Thank you for organizing this. Um, I hope there will be another webinar. Um, and lastly, I've been told to remind all of you there's a uh, feedback that we'd like to receive from you on this webinar. So fill in the poll. Let us know what you think and uh, I'll find out. Thank you, everyone.